Hey, I want to invite you to open to Hebrews chapter 3. As we continue in our study together, we are entering into a new chapter, but it's not a new theme. Uh, listen, the author is continuing this, this conversation about the supremacy of Christ, how he is superior over all things, not just the angels, not just since past prophets, but he is the ruler of the world. He is the creator of the world. He is the sustainer of the world. And yet today, we go a different angle. That he is even greater than any other prophet, even Moses. And it's like as soon as the Jewish people heard that, they would gasp. How could you say such a thing? Because after all, Moses is a hero. I mean, Moses is the one who took Israel on dry land uh, across the Red Sea. That God used Moses in miraculous ways, just with the pointing of his staff, that not only would the seas part, but also that water would come forth out of a rock. Manna would fall from heaven. Israel saw miracle after miracle after miracle because of, of God's work through his servant Moses. And yet here we are hearing that no, Jesus, he actually even deserves more glory, more honor, and a greater focus on him rather than anything else. When you think about focus, it's one of those things that you know about, but it's very seldom that we would think of it as a means of changing our trajectory. And now here's what I want to talk about in that, because listen, there is a lot of mysticism that floats around the world today, especially in the world of psychology, that would tell you that, listen, if you think it, it's going to happen. If you pray it, it's going to happen. You see how we baptize modern psychology? If you do this, then you are going to end up with this. If you do this, and it's like this, this pragmatism that rules the day. That someone has figured out and unlocked the formula for how uh, you can lose weight, how you can make six figures, how you can make your first million, how you can do X, how you can do Y, and all of these things. If you just focus on these things that I tell you, then you're going to unlock like you're riding on the magic school bus uh, inside a whale. I mean, this is the lie that the world will tell you. This isn't the focus that I'm talking about that would change your trajectory. The focus that I'm talking about that changes your trajectory is within the sovereignty, within the hands of God. But what changes is the way that you walk through it. The way you walk through your circumstance. And yes, there is this alignment that by God's grace and by God's sovereignty, running parallel, sometimes intersecting, but definitely a part of the same God in your life. But what this does is that it determines the outcome of how you can walk through something, either with delight, either with joy, or you can walk with it apart from God's design. There is something about our focus that changes our perspective and that possibly by God's grace in his sovereignty can change and manipulate the way we come through every circumstance. You see, it was back in 1993 when the Cowboys were playing, who was it? I think it's the Bills. Man, I just totally went blank there. All right. In the Super Bowl, 1993. Anybody? Help, bills. Thank you. Okay, in Dean we trust today. All right, but but listen, what happened is they obviously blew him out of the water, fifty-two to seventeen. It was just a great dominant game by the Cowboys. And today's generation, 
You don't understand what that looks like. But there used to be a dominant Cowboys team. But here's what they were wanting to know. They were all wondering, okay, well, what was the secret formula for the way that you came out of the locker room onto the field? So they go to Jimmy Johnson like, coach, what did you tell the players before they ran out through the tunnel? He said, I talked to them only about their focus. What are you focused on? He said, and I I told them to imagine that you were walking on the ground. Say that Coach Johnson put a two-by-four in the middle of the locker room, and he told the players, he said, imagine that you have to walk on this two-by-four, and you can't step onto the ground. And everybody could do this with absolutely no problem. But then he said, but what would happen if I put that same two by four about 10 stories high, stretching across two buildings? How could you do then? It's the same two by four, the same length, the same width, the same amount of steps it would take to get across. But something is different in your ability, and it has everything to do with where your focus is. On the ground, you're focusing on your steps. Up 10 stories high, you are focusing on the fact that if you step wrong, you're going to die. He says, what you focus on matters. And here's what the writer of Hebrews is telling us today. Your focus on Christ will determine the way you walk with Christ. Don't you want a deeper walk with God? Don't you want to have a secure walk with Christ? Then the call for us is to have a greater focus on Christ. If you would, would you stand with me? If you're willing and able, we're going to read the first six verses together. If you don't have your own Bible or a copy of God's Word, there's one in the seat in front of you. And if you don't have your own Bible, just consider that as a gift from this church to you, and you can have that Bible. But this is what it says, starting in verse 1. It says, Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in a heavenly calling, and here's that key phrase, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was in all God's household. For Jesus is considered worthy of more glory than Moses, just as the builder has more honor than the house. Now every house is built by someone, but the one who built everything is God. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's household as a testimony to what would be said in the future. But Christ was faithful as a son over his household, and we are that household if we hold on to our confidence and the hope in which we boast. Let's pray. God, would you speak to us now? Father, would you help us to be attentive and sensitive to your words? God, that you would pierce our hearts in the ways that only you can, because you know us intimately and you know exactly what we need to hear. So Father, as we hear it, give us the confidence and the strength to obey it. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen. You may be seated once again. That key phrase, consider Jesus. This is the idea that we get that we have to focus Because the call here to consider is not this lighthearted type of consideration. If I were to say, what what are you considering for lunch? That would be lighthearted. There's not a lot of pressure on that other than to make your spouse happy maybe. But then as you get to that place that you're going to lunch, it would be what are you considering to eat? This is the type of lightweight consideration that we often think of. But this is not the call as far as our consideration in reference to Christ. Instead, when the writer says, consider Jesus, 
What he means is that give Christ, give Jesus your full attention, all of your focus. Consider Jesus. But we have to consider the right Jesus. We don't just give full attention and full focus to any ideology that comes about even in regards to Jesus. That we don't just go to and fro with every wind of doctrine that the world has to offer us even about Christ. But rather, as a church family, we are called to protect doctrine. We are called to protect the theology, especially when it comes to Christ, because this is our understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the good news is only good if it is right and pure and according to God's design. Not every news that you hear about Jesus is good if it is not according to the Bible. You see, the Bible, uh, the Jesus that we worship is the Jesus of the Bible. And so we have to make sure that when we talk about considering Jesus, giving Jesus our full attention, our full focus, we want to make sure that we are considering rightly about Jesus. That we are focusing on the right things about Jesus not becoming imbalanced one way or the other, but rightly. And the writer is very gracious because we have an understanding according to these six verses of how and what we are to consider about Christ. The first thing that we see from the author is that we are to consider the faithfulness of Christ. This is where he begins in verses 1 and 2. He says, therefore, holy brothers and sisters, we share in a heavenly calling. Consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. But here it is. It says, he was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was in all God's household. Now, when we think about why would we, the writer gives so much attention to Moses in these first six verses, it's so that we can understand by example throughout the Old Testament of who Christ is, that we can see what was to come by the examples given before. But this is also a teaching opportunity to the Jewish people who held such a high esteem for Moses. Now, here's what we are going to see throughout these six verses is that not at any time is anything going to be said about Moses that would be at the expense of Moses. You see how the writer doesn't exalt Christ and glorify Christ at the expense of Moses. It's pretty delicate in the way that he does it. He's calling them to a higher focus, a greater focus, not to diminish the work that God has already done in the Old Testament and through Moses and through the people of God, but to exalt Christ all the more. Have you ever known anyone to maybe give you a backhanded compliment? Maybe at the expense of someone else. See, this is a good example for us of how we can encourage others, not at the expense of the discouragement of another brother or sister. That we can actually do both well. You can actually encourage people without discouraging another person. That you can talk well of someone without talking poorly uh, at the expense of someone else. And this is what the writer does. He is talking so highly of Christ that there's no possible way that you could be confused in the process that it's at the expense of Moses. But where he talks about this faithfulness, he says that Jesus was faithful to the one that appointed him, the one that gave Jesus the assignment. 
the one that said uh, to Jesus from eternity past, this is the design, this is the way in which we will go and operate, Jesus was faithful to that appointment. And praise be to God, or you and I would not be here today apart from the faithfulness of Jesus to his appointment. But what about this appointment? And why is it so important? It's because this appointment, the fact that Christ was faithful to the appointment, it provided the message. All right, now I want you to think about this in verse 1. Because it, when he talks about Jesus, he says a key phrase here. He says two attributes about Jesus and, and about this appointment and what it brings. It says that he is the apostle. So what I want us to see in this about this message that Christ brought is that he brought the message because he is the apostle. Now, what does it mean that Jesus is the apostle, that he is a apostle? What it means is that Jesus, the apostle, is that he is the sent one. That's what apostle means, is that one being sent, And this goes completely in line with the way that Jesus would even describe himself in John chapter 17, verse 18. He says this to his disciples. He says, "Um, as you sent me into the world, I also am sending you into the world. I have sent them into the world. So Jesus recognizes his apostleship in this way so that we could understand his appointment better. That what does this provide? Well, it says that he is the apostle. Not just another apostle, but rather he is the apostle. Because when you and I think about apostleship, we think about the 12. We think about the ones that Jesus sent out in order to start the the New Testament church and the way that we see it today. But when it says that Jesus is the apostle, what it is describing here is not just someone else with another message, but with someone who has came with the message because he is the message. Make no confusion about this. That Jesus is sending those out with the message of who he is. And so he has come so that we may know ultimately this message, the good news of Jesus Christ. But it also provides the means. Just as we saw last week, that Jesus is the means by which we are saved. There is no other name by which we can or could or should be saved. We see that he is the means for salvation. How do we get this from the verse? Well, it says that Jesus, the apostle and high priest. Right there. See, I knew it would come up. Jesus, the apostle and high priest. So once again, we see this continuation of this theme that we we see just kind of going in and out of the book of Hebrews already. We're going to get to it even deeper in chapter 5. But all the way through Hebrews, we see Jesus, this high priest. In fact, Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote a book about Hebrews, and it's just called Our High Priest. And this is what we see uh, from the high priest is that he is the one who goes to God on behalf of the people of God. Just as we talked about in Hebrews chapter 1, I would see that Jesus is prophet, priest, and king. Here it is again. Hey, I want to remind you, Jewish brothers and sisters, that Jesus alone is the great high priest. I mean, you think about the way this was exampled even in the Old Testament, even through the life of Moses. And the reason why Moses is being used is because they think of Moses as the greatest mediator of all time. Moses stood on Mount Sinai and went to God on behalf of the people. He begged God, don't destroy him. Don't destroy him. Don't destroy him. Remember your people. Remember your people. And all of that, Israel would look to Moses as the mediator. But here we see 
that that has nothing in comparison to our great high priest who is Jesus Christ, who gave his life so that he could sit at the right hand of the Father and speak on your behalf to the God of glory. He's saying, this is our high priest. But it's not just the faithfulness of God of Christ that we have to consider. He takes it even further into Jewish tradition. And he tells us we must consider the foundation of Christ. The way that this progresses, as you see in verses 3 and 4, he says, for Jesus is considered worthy of more glory than Moses, just as the builder has more honor than the house. Now, every house is built by someone, but the one who built everything is who? Is God. I mean, you think about that for a second. No house is going to receive glory. Like you're not going to walk through your neighborhood and you're not going to look at the houses. You're not going to look at the architecture. You're not going to look at the design and think, wow, how creative is that house that built itself? Like nobody's going to think that. Everybody's going to think about the creativity of the architect. They're going to think about the creativity of the builder. Like how the builder put all of these things together according to the plan, and and here it stands. In the same way, this is the way that the writer is referencing the house of Israel. You see, Moses was a servant in the house. God is the creator of the house. To put it differently, can you imagine three different Olympic athletes, and they're talking about uh, what they accomplished. One of them says, I ran the fastest um, 10 meter. Oh, I I swam the fastest uh, whatever event, okay? And I did the greatest tumbling on the gymnastics floor, okay? Those three are just boasting in their, their abilities and they're talking about what they did great at. And then they come to Jesus and they ask Jesus, well, what event did you win? And he said, well, I created all of them. You see, this is the level that we have to get at in our understanding about Jesus Christ being the builder, that he is the creator of all things, as we have already seen in Hebrews 1-2. He is the sustainer of all things, yes, but it is a reminder for us to not detach that reality from the house of Israel. And he's putting this in a trajectory like this in our understanding so that we could know our place as the clay rather than the potter. The one who is, not the one who is creating. We are the the ones who were created by the creator. So we have to understand that in the house of Israel that he's never referring to a structure. When we see even throughout the Old Testament, and the house of Israel is not the tabernacle. It is not uh, the temple. The house of Israel is not a, a structure or a refuge or any type of, of built thing. But rather, it is always in reference to the people of God. And so he's taking this understanding as the nation of Israel, and now he is describing the the church today. He says, you are, at the very end, he says, you are the house. You are the people of God. And this is what he reminds us of is that Jesus is the builder of the church. There is nothing else that builds the church. You cannot look at anything around us and think, well, man, it was this event of the past that that built the church and it grew so rapidly, it grew so quickly, and we can't look to a past program. We can't look to even past ministers of the gospel, although the, the Lord used them, he uses these things, but it's not them, it is not the program, it is not the method that builds the church. It is Jesus Christ who builds his church, and everything else is just on fire faulty ground. This is the warning that we even see from Isaiah. He gives us this reality about 
the Messiah who is to come. And he says in Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16, it says, look, I have laid a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. The one who believes will be unshakable. Like, don't you want that kind of life that is unshakable? I mean, Jesus even tells us and warns us in Matthew 7 to, to make sure, make sure that you build your life on the rock. Make sure you build your marriage on the rock. Make sure you build your family on the rock, your business on the rock. And yes, ultimately, we have to build the church on the rock because that is the only sure foundation. He is not a piece of the church. He is the cornerstone of every building, every church, every family that will secure you through all times. You see, this is what is incredible, is that the universal church at large, listen, you think, this is what ties us against all odds. This is what ties us together from centuries past and, Lord willing, centuries forward. That since 1955, just the history of Green Acres Baptist Church, what ties us all together in all generations? And listen, it is nothing other than the fact that we have one foundation, and his name is Jesus. We have one cornerstone. His name is Jesus. Listen, I assure you, the church looks different today than it did in 1955. I assure you, the music is different today than it was in 1955. I assure you that the preacher is different and much worse than it was in 1955. I assure you these things. Why? Because none of those things will ever tether the people of God together, nor will it keep us tethered to Christ. He's saying, listen, if you want to have an unshakable church, an unshakable life, then fix your eyes on the one who will never let anything shake you. It is Jesus Christ alone. If you want to build a church or a family on anything else. He says it's going to wash away. This is why we have to make sure that we consider Jesus as our one true foundation. And we consider the fulfillment of Christ. See the way that he ends this. In verses 5 and 6, in verse 5, it says, Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's household as a testimony to what would be said in the future. You see, what we have is that everything that happened in the Old Testament, everything that happened in the life of Moses, everything that happened as he was leading Israel out of bondage, into freedom, wandering in the desert, all of these stages of life, everything was pointing to a greater fulfillment that would come from this Messiah. In fact, Jesus even says this about himself in Luke chapter 24, verse 44. He says, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. See, we think to ourselves, well, okay, well, they are fulfilled, but now what? Why does this give us encouragement? Why does this give us a, a type of steadiness when we consider the fulfillment of Christ that has already happened? Because here's what is incredible about Jesus fulfilling all that he said he would do, because there, there's some fulfillment left. You and I are in between these testimonies of what has already been fulfilled and what will be fulfilled. But you and I know the end. We know the future. 
And he says, listen, if you just think about these things, not only did I promise I was going to send a Messiah, I did. Not only did I promise that he was going to come of a virgin, and he did. Not only did I promise that he was going to uh, live a perfect life on your behalf, he did. He was going to raise up a new nation, raise up a new people, raise up and start this blast of a church, this movement that will advance the gospel across the globe. He did those things, and he said that I'm going to send my son to die on your behalf, but don't lose heart because he's going to rise again on the third day. All of these things happened. Everything that God said was going to happen, happened. And then he says, but listen, I'm about to leave you. He tells his disciples. And Thomas starts questioning everything, right? Thomas is the one who is saying, Lord, what, what do you mean you're going to leave us? And Jesus is like, hey, listen, where I am going, you know the way. Because listen, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Thomas, you don't have to worry, man. I'm going to build a place. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And where I'm going, my father's house, there are many rooms. He says, but I'm going to come back and I'm going to get you. That where I am, there you will be. And Thomas, still confused, he's like, but Jesus, what? Okay, listen, I hear you, but we seriously, I'm not joking. Lord, please just hear me out. I don't know how to get there. How do we get there? And Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. That nobody goes to the Father except through me. What a sigh of relief to consider that it's not up to Thomas just figuring it all out. It's just up to Thomas to consider Jesus. Focus on Jesus. Place your gaze upon Jesus because everything else is worthless. Everything else is not going to give you security. Gaze upon him. I don't know if you like camping or not. My family used to love tent camping. Then we had an incident. There was a coyote that came and sniffed my wife's head. So she claims, okay? (laughs) And our family hasn't been camping since. Unless it is in a solid wood structure. Okay, then my wife will go camping. I want you to imagine if you were camping and there's this dreaded sound that you hear all of a sudden. The sound that you know well, but you fear greatly. Right outside your tent, you hear this. And you know right off, that's a timber rattler right there. And then you think to yourself, okay, am I hearing that inside the tent or outside the tent? I would say it matters to figure out. But then it gets louder. And it gets louder. It gets louder. Your heart starts pounding because you know what it is. You know what is happening around you. And it gets louder and louder. And you're thinking, well, i got to figure out what is going on. And so you just kind of unzip just a little bit just to look outside to see what is going on. And all you can see is just a sea of rattlers all around you. You think to yourself, well, how am I going to get out of this? I'm not going to be able to hop through. I'm not going to be able to rake my way through. There's no way around this. I can't get anywhere. I'm completely surrounded. There's absolutely no hope. You might be thinking to yourself, boy, I am glad that this is a made-up story. But it was the reality for the people of God in Numbers chapter 21. Because of their continued sin and their grumbling against the Lord, not against Moses, not against Aaron, 
They're grumbling against the Lord. You know what the Bible tells us is that the Lord sent poisonous snakes into the camp of Israel with no antidote, with no antivenom. And this is what happened. The snakes went in and they started biting people. And people were dying. And they started wondering, God, why are you letting this happen? Why in the world is this going on? And Moses, the priest for the people of God, started begging the Lord, God, would you do something? Like, help us, Lord, get rid of these snakes. I mean, there's nothing that we can do about all this, and they are killing our people. And this is what it says in Numbers 21, verses 7 and 9. It says, the people came to Moses. We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. It says, intercede with the Lord so that he will take the snakes away from us. Moses interceded for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, make a snake image and mount it on a pole. When anyone who is bitten looks at it, he will recover. So Moses made a bronze snake and mounted it on a pole. Whoever, uh, whenever someone was bitten and he looked at the bronze snake, he recovered. See, this is what God provided. That if you would just gaze upon that snake, you'll be saved. If you just fix your eyes upon this snake, then you will be healed. You will recover. But this was a temporal solution from a temporal leader for a temporal problem of snakes. Because this is going to point and be fulfilled in none only than Jesus Christ himself and not for some temporal problem but for an eternal problem that you and I are facing, this problem of sin, the problem of, of this self-righteousness that we try to impose on ourselves and impose on God, and we hope for the best in life, but, but the only one who can heal you, the only one who can save you from your sins is if you were to gaze upon the cross of Christ, if you would fix your eyes on Jesus, if you would focus on him, he is promising that he will save you from your sins, save you from your unrighteousness, save you from your own doubts, save you from all that this world is putting up against you. And he is faithful. He is just. He will cleanse you from all unrighteousness if you would just focus and gaze upon the Savior of the world. He says this in John 3, 14 and 15, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes may have eternal life. You see, every time we come to the Lord's table to partake in the Lord's Supper, this is what we are called to do, to fix our eyes on Christ. When Jesus took his disciples in the upper room, he broke the bread, he took the cup, and he says, every time you eat of this bread, every time you drink of this, do so in remembrance of me. It is this realignment of our focus, a realignment of our gaze upon the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Savior of the world. And so this is what I just want to invite you to do right now. As you prepare your heart to participate in the Lord's Supper today, I want to tell you the same words that Paul tells us. He says, do not come to this table unclean. Gives it to us as a warning. For some of you, this needs to be a time of confession. Maybe you need to have your focus renewed. That you've just been distracted by everything else in life. 
everything else that is going on around you. And you know deep down that, listen, I'm a follower of Jesus, but he doesn't really have my attention. And I just give you a warning. Where your focus is, your affection will follow. Your affections will always follow your focus. Your loyalty will always follow your focus. And for some of us in the room, that means that today we need to fix our alignment and focus once again on Christ. For some of you, you know that you have never looked upon Jesus for your salvation. Maybe today that you need to fix your eyes on Jesus for the first time. To gaze upon the cross for your salvation. Whatever it is, I just want to give you about 30 seconds to just pray before anybody moves to just pray and fix your focus on Christ right where you are. distracted we are. God, it is so easy for everything else in life to have our focus other than you. Father, I first ask, God, would you forgive me for the times that I am not completely focused on you and your cause, your kingdom, your purpose in my own life. God, forgive me when I lead that is not according to a laser focus on your purpose. God, as a church family, Lord, we ask you, Lord, would you help us only focus on you as your people for your purpose And for your glory, God, would you help us to have a greater focus? God, for those who are in the room right now, they have never been saved. They have never been focused on you. God, I pray right now that you would open their eyes to your truth. That with their eyes open, they would gaze upon the cross, upon the Savior who died in their place. And so, Father, as we prepare our hearts right now to come to your table, would you give us that focus and remember the cross? And it's in the name of Jesus we pray.